take the floor. However, the invitation goes to the audience. Please, ladies and gentlemen, your questions. Mr. Ensman, Harold Ensman used to work with uh, Procter & Gamble. Now I'm a member of several supervisory boards. Mr. Spahn, my compliments. This was an exciting presentation, a dry topic and a wonderful presentation. Secondly, let me tell you that I lived in different European countries and also in the United States. And I would I like to also praise Germany because all the figures, all the numbers you've given are extraordinary. And most of them are much better than in the other countries where I lived. However, my question concerning the numbers, you compared the current situation with uh, the previous year, but what about the best practices? I mean, I would like to know more about where do we stand as compared to other countries, to the ones who do best. I mean, that's something Mr. Trump wouldn't want to hear, but it's my question. Compare the current figures to the best practice. And then you talked about the right to vote and the young generation. You are certainly right. However, there are quite simple solutions. A, political parties should not panic 18 months before the next elections in, in order to then go and talk to just anybody about anybody. Sachi and Sachi, for example, a PR agency which used to make the English prime minister strong again and again. And they managed, actually they managed to turn bad results prior to elections to good results in the elections. And then the lacking funds for pension payments. I guess we need to organize migration because if Japan and the United States and Germany don't do it, we'll die out. And you should do what your boss, Mrs. Merkel, does, who admits millions without even checking who gets into the country. And then as far as elections are concerned, what about the obligation or the duty to vote in Belgium where I am an expert, expert now, you need to vote. And if you don't vote, you have to pay. That's my recommendation. Right. The direct answering mode is the best one, because otherwise I would do what politicians do. I skip all the questions I don't want to answer. Now, the obligation or the duty to vote. We've talked about it quite a bit. And the exciting bit of the last two years is that in the six regional elections and the federal elections, we have had a much higher participation than we used to have, which makes me happy, irrespective of the result. I mean, the society has become much more political. If you, if you travel, if you talk to people, you talk about you, you talk politics and there are many more controversies and I, I'd love to see many more controversial debates. We should do this. We should do this again over lunch, over dinner, just talk politics. And that's not about the hatred which has just been mentioned. That's not a debate, but an emotional controversial debate might also trigger an interest in politics and get us even more participants in elections, so we need to find solutions by talking about politics too. That's certainly an encouraging trend we've seen in the last few months and years. Now, best practices. The structures here are very different from what we see in other countries, but we do have the Federal Auditing Court, and they, of course, check what we do. There are spending reviews we need to submit. All institutions need to submit these reviews 
This is a process which started about three years ago. I.e., you look at three, four, five, six budget items in detail, and then you double check in detail what happens with the money, what you do, like labor market programs, in order to find out what can be done better and more efficient. Now, defense spending. The GDP figures alone don't help you. Greece has done more in the field of uh, defense expenditure because the overall budget dropped, which means the relative proportion of the budget or of the um, GDP increases. But this is about reasonable spending. We have budget goals, for example, in the field of environment, environmental, sorry, development policy, 3.5% GDP, also research, scientific research. Now, these goals are good because they are based on the assumption that we need to spend more, but the sum alone doesn't tell you much. And just to spend more money on defense just because doesn't help you either. So we need an efficient and reasonable expenditure. And we don't have international comparisons here, but we have internal reviews and audits and mechanisms. Now, last but not least, immigration. If you go and talk to whoever in Germany and say, we need an immigration law, people agree. But what does it mean? What do you mean by migration or immigration laws? Is it about closing the borders and everybody who's here shall stay? Or is it about admitting a certain amount of people and then it's over. And what about taxation? I mean, an immigration law, regulations, legislation, what does it mean? What are the criteria? That's the question. And it does make sense to adopt an immigration law if you allow for illegal immigration. That is to say, the EU needs to control its borders because it cannot be smugglers who go and decide whether Germany or Italy are immigration countries. It's going to be exciting, certainly, but it does make sense to adopt an immigration law without any control. I mean, we also have to talk about quotas or similar things, but immigration, I mean, it, it, it's kind of surprising, but no matter where you go, in West Germany, in Hamburg, or in Southern Germany, in the Alps, for example, Immigration is what people think is good, and immigration law is good. People are convinced that we need migrants and that we need an immigration law. However, as far as the criteria are concerned, there is a certain political quarrel, and this is going to be an important topic in the weeks to come. Well, that's interesting because Mr. Schäuble was here, I think it was in 2012 or 13, and at the time, he said we need an immigration law, so this is not a new item. So you really need to listen to Convoco and then do what's being recommended. Next question. Lucas Elmenhorst. As far as the very concept of an immigration law is concerned, well, I'd like to say that there is a general consensus which is more or less like the Canadian or the Australian system. That's what people want to have. But the interesting question is, why haven't we pondered the question in the last four years since Mr. Schäuble has, uh, since Mr. Schäuble has brought it up? But uh, I, I want to talk about the common good. And you mentioned the common good and demographic change. Now, demographic change in Germany goes along with wealth and well-being, an unprecedented well-being. And there is a connection between the two phenomena, phenomena. And Paul Kirchhoff was very eloquent in describing it. But this is, for example, about the introduction of a just and fair uh, heritage tax. Fifteen percent on everything. And if you don't manage to get these 15 percent otherwise, you have to ask different questions. But this would be a way 
to do something about the budget deficits, which amount to about one third of the budget, or which might amount to up to one third of the budget. Unfortunately, nobody's talking about the inheritance tax. A pity. Well, I try and be brief. And yet, the immigration law, the regulations we have in place are much better than what you think. The OECD said that Germany has one of the best immigration laws of the world, but nobody knows it. And Well, well bear with me. I, I'm still talking. People don't live this law in our administration because the welcome culture concept, a concept people have used quite a bit in the last two years, is an aspect in the debate. I, I went to Mumbai and I said, well, what about dealing with an Indian engineer who wants to travel to Germany in order to work here? People are shocked and they don't know an answer. And what about the software developer with a contract amounting to 200,000 euros waiting on an island somewhere in Europe until eventually an authority says, OK, you can come. But that's not a legal problem as such. It's because of the process, processes, the consular offices, the embassies, and all the other agencies involved are trying hard to not give a person the feeling to be th that he or she is welcome. Now, Canada is right now changing its law. You can. Um, enter the country based on a certain number of credits, irrespective of your job or irrespective of your profession. But the Canadians are, are right now changing the system. However, they want to offer a clear professional or study perspective. And you could also look at the website in order to get a better idea of what the system is and how it works. So the, there is a law in place, but it's not being implemented. And there are lots of processes and people therefore don't see that we do have a regulation. And all this only makes sense once you control your borders. If you don't control the borders, you don't need a law. Does make sense. Now, the inheritance tax is, of course, important as far as social justice is concerned. On the other hand, the amounts we are talking about here are not much money, five billion. I mean, that's, of course, a lot of money. But if you look at the overall taxation volume in Germany on the local and the national and the regional level, it's not much. I mean, the federal government does not even benefit the 16 federal states can go and adopt their own laws. And I'm pretty sure that Bavaria and Bremen will have very different inheritance taxes. You might go and say 15% on top of everything and an installment payment system. You can also go and say we'll do without it because it's not enough money. I mean, these are arguments and right now, the way the majorities were in the federal parliament and in the Bundesrat, none of the proposals could find a majority. Maybe you help us so that we manage to bring something about in the next 10 years. I mean, we talked about this tax law for at least a year. It's always been an item on the agenda. I did not have the impression that people didn't talk about it. Well, please, one question per person and short questions. And I'd like to come back to an interesting aspect, because you ask, why are we talking about the immigration law? Why didn't we talk about it when Mr. Schäuble said it or, or mentioned it? it a few years ago. I think this might be a human problem, but this is also um, an aspect which involves strategies and long-term approaches. We need strategies in order to cover 
a certain period of time, and maybe it's difficult to define what the common good is within an administrative or legislative period of four years. Well, maybe, but look back at what we had on the agenda 25 years ago, the 1990s. Lots of unemployed early retirement programs because people thought that it would be good to send the elderly into a pension payment system so that younger ones can work, asylum seekers. People also said, why shouldn't they work? Because they can help us. But at the time, this was not an option at all because there was a major unemployment rate. There were lots of people jobless and nobody would have accepted that asylum seekers work. Now, things have changed. Societal structures have changed and a lot has happened since then. And this does not only refer to what is being discussed and how we talk about things. This is also about regulations and how we implement and enforce them. In 20 years, the situation will certainly be very different from what we are seeing today. The freedom of movement in, in, in Europe has changed a lot, so it's not static. The common good changes as we saw before. Now let's get back to old age pension payments. 85 billion euros are being paid on top of what is available, which is more than 25% of the budget. It's about one third even. And in 2030, it will be 125 billion, right. The federal government will have to subsidize the retirement schemes. And of course, there are ideological debates. What do we do in view of parental leave periods, for example? What do we do about German resettlers, for example? And there are also dangerous solutions which are being proposed also in the field of unemployment or health insurances, because if people go and say, we don't want to increase the labor costs, we should just take money from the federal budget. I mean, as you could see when you looked at the health insurance system, this works well when the overall situation is good, but when the economy is down and we have less public income, we won't be able to help fund retirement programs. In other words, our approach is not a very flexible one and there is not much room to maneuver. This is, so to speak, the sweet poison of a healthy economy. But the more money they take away from us, taxation-wise, the less stupid the ideas which are being produced are. That's maybe a good um, way to see things. But we are also dealing with the challenges of the future and digitization. What about the challenges we need to meet brought up by other countries like the um, expenditure policy on the EU level? The question is also how can we establish options that help us overcome problematic situations. Right now, we are an export nation, and of course, we are benefiting from those exports, but we cannot assume that we cannot take growth, economic growth for, for granted. Well, we could go and introduce a quota system, like on each euro spent in addition to what is in general spent on social welfare, social security, one euro is spent on investment programs. The question is, what principles 
do we want to adhere to when talking about the budget and how to distribute the budget? Social expenditure refers to present times. The question is how much future orientation is there in a budget? But it would be exciting to connect both levels. Right now, there is no majority for such an approach, but this might be an interesting approach, a productive one, also in order to get out of the mere political field. Wolfgang Ischinger, please. Let me ask you about Europe. I guess we all agree that you don't convince con potential voters to vote for you by mentioning Europe. Now, the elections are over, and yesterday, the French President Macron gave an extraordinary speech. The German reactions in the last 24 hours were was more or less characterized by skepticism. There was also a slight element of rejection in the German reaction. Now, if you were the one to decide when looking at the German budget of the year 2013, 30, how much would be the share of the EU? And should we find a German vision as against Monsieur Macron's vision? Should we act as advisors or consultants, or is there a specifically French and German vision, or is there a European one? Well, it's always a bit risky to answer a question which is like, if you would want to decide it, and yet. In many European countries, The situation is very different from the German one. And in Germany, people do not really question the European integration, which is different from other European countries. People talk about the euro here, that's true. But the general um, willingness to cooperate and to give up a certain amount of sovereignty is not a problem in Germany, which is different in other countries. However, we are in a trap here because if you talk to pupils today, well, most of them are were born in the year 2009-11 is history book lessons. And when they were born, we had the Euro, Barcelona, Helsinki, Breslau, whatever place they go, they travel without ever showing their passport to anybody, which is different when we were young. I mean, it, it, it's good to have all this, and the same goes for the freedom we enjoy. However, the Brexit has shown us that whatever we enjoy in Europe today is based on certain premises. Now, Macron's speech. It's extraordinary because he focused on problems which need to be solved, and we assume that we can solve these problems together. I don't like debates like the ones that focus on institutions. So it's important to talk about a European minister of finance or about how to deal with the Brits, for example. But 10 million voters for Le Pen who share a Euro skepticism, won't be convinced by the installment or the institution and establishment of a European Minister of Finance. There are other problems we need to solve, and we can solve these problems better together, which is, for example, securing our borders. If you want to enjoy the freedom of movement, you need to protect the border. In the past, we said, well, that's up to Italy or Greece, for example. But this is not true. Giving up sovereignty 
is another aspect. Joint border controls, joint new institutions. Well, this is certainly what people agree to, a joint security policy. I mean, you cannot talk about Washington all the time and criticize Washington, but then we are not focusing on our security policy either. I mean, does anybody really think that we can cope with security problems all by ourselves without U.S. support with an A400M, which travels one way but won't get back because it broke. it's broke. We do have 24 different military types in our troops and units. I guess we can do much better in this field, and I am convinced that we can convince the population. Terrorism, that's another topic. Paris, Brussels, the Breitscheidplatz in Berlin, that's also an important topic. And then sensitive fields like the economy, empower the economy, more investment, better investment. Right now, we are spending EU funds on European transport networks and traffic networks. Galileo would be an example. We should also have a European cloud. We do see major server capacities in the United States and in Asia. As Airbus, Airbus and GPS kind of counter Boeing and GPS, we could do something like a European cloud, or we could have a European Stanford, a university focusing on digitization right at the frontier, for example. So we should focus on the future, on research, on future projects instead of focusing on debt. A digital internal market impulses in order to overcome that, but we should not go and try to find European ways of overcoming our debts instead of solving these problems on a national level. So we need to focus on the attempt of solving problems instead of talking about institutions. There is a shared ground, I'd say. Andreas Bartl. Andreas Bartlness. I would like to come back to the common good. It was nicely explained how the negotiation process in the political process looks like, but what I was missing was the reference framework. The reference framework might be different at the municipal level and at the lender level, the regional level. The tendencies of radicalization that we're currently seeing also are based on the different definitions of common good. With the refugee crisis, for example, the common good was defined almost globally. With the Euro rescue package, the common good was defined at the European level. So the question is, do we have to def communicate better that we have new reference frames for the term common good, or do we need to create the institution for it? And you also mentioned Google. On the other hand, we do not succeed in raising taxes on these new reference frames. Let me start with the taxation part, because we talked about the taxation of digital services and digital companies in Europe. It's important. It's also important to have this Franco-German initiative, but it's equally important to um, establish big companies that we can tax later on. So let's first talk about the companies. And um, we haven't really got an equivalent for companies the size of Google, Facebook, or um, Apple. So I think that's equally important and not always focus on the tax debate. But um, the reference frame is also very important. It's a very interesting um, theoretical question also. What? gives us the willingness to show solidarity. So why are we all in this room here willing to pay taxes and levies for somebody 
in the north of Germany or in the south of Germany or in the west of Germany that you've never seen and will probably never see, but you support this person through your taxes, um, health insurance, pension insurance, social assistance, education, wherever. Even though you've never seen these people and you will never see them, there seems to be something that makes us feel part of one common community where as a German citizen, as a, as, as, as a German citizen, as a member of this um, country, of this nation, there seems to be something that within this frame of reference you are willing to show state-imposed solidarity and be limited in your freedom as a citizen. And we see that this willingness decreases the bigger the reference frame. The willingness to have a European unemployment insurance, that's a proposal that always comes up. And we have a big redistribution in Germany from Bavaria to Berlin, to not always quote Bremen. When it comes to unemployment insurances, the employment ratio is different, economic power is different. So redistribution within Germany is given. The willingness to expand this system across Europe, which would mean that German taxpayers, depending on how you set the system up, and Dutch and Austrian taxpayers, etc., would have to pay for a lot of redistribution towards Romania, Bulgaria, and Portugal. Is that a reference frame that would show the same level of solidarity where you would say, I'm so close to the Portuguese that I like to pay an additional um, premium for them? And if you make it even bigger and make it global and say, let's um, have some redistribution with the unemployed people in Bangladesh, then the level of acceptance to say that's a system that I want to participate in will go down even further. Can this willingness be changed? Yes, within Europe, I think so. The debates um, during the financial crisis have become a lot more European. The perception with regard to problems in other countries and the common good in other countries has changed. Um, when have we ever um, looked in such an in-depth way at Greece, Portugal, and other countries? So I think that's self-evident, but there are limits of what people accept as a frame of reference apart from private donations. And the experience we've made is that the national social state so far seems to be the one element that still has a level of willingness that is um, acceptable. But this is something that um, is very much related with the election outcomes of Sunday, this question of um, fairness. The 70-year-old or one seventy year old mother of five with 13 grandchildren, does she get as much money as somebody who arrived in Germany just last week and would actually have to leave the country again? And that's a question that um, a lot of people ponder also from the perspective of fairness and migration, social um, justice, etc. Um, play into this. This is an equation that I cannot solve at the moment, but it's something that a lot of people are thinking about, and it's a debate that we will. Um you can skip. You maybe know a study made available by Professor Kai Conrad. According to this study, the more I feel I belong to a community, the more I am willing to pay tax. Mr. Pocher, I think we had a study at the forum this year. So there is a correlation. The belonging is the decisive bit. There's also another interesting study. Um, how much confidence is there within the society um, the model was they um, took 500 euro bills and put them on the street and then looked at how people reacted to that. And if you believe that if somebody who is different or foreign brings and finds my 500 euros and will bring that to the lost and found, and then the assumption is that the others would do it for you as well. And the more heterogeneous culture-wise a uh, society is, the lower the level of confidence that in such a situation 
there is the mutual will to take the 500 euros to the lost and found office. And you can like this or not, but you will have to deal with such um, a finding if you look at cohesion within a society. Another question from the floor. I'm a um, self-employed political um, analyst and consultant, and I am um, also worried about um, Europe, similar to Mr. Ischinger. I agree with you. Um, but I'd like to come back to what you said during your speech, namely that the common good are uh, the common good is um, budget plans cast into figures. So you answered um, Mr. Ishinger's question um, in theory, but how does the EU budget in 2030 look like? Um, can you express it in figures? Will it still be one percent of the economic performance? Will the member states still refuse to pay more into the European budget? What will the task included in it be? You also said um, border protection that needs to be reflected in the European budget. I don't um, want to venture out and give you um, numbers, but the willingness to step up these funds is given if the problems that exist are tackled at the European level. Um, at the moment, the budget of the European Union doesn't have enough European um, added value. We finance um, bike lanes in um, countries in Europe, and everybody is happy about the money, but it's not a European added value. It's um, border protection, um, security, internal market, etc., that really create an European added value. The agricultural and the structural funds have a very strong national um, component. You only look at whether you pay in or you um, get money out, but it's not a European added value that's created here. So our proposals, because we um, China has five-year plans, Europe has seven-year um, plans when it comes to um, budget planning, but we are now talking about these seven years, and we say the funds paid into the structural fund cannot just be taken away, but we link them to a European added value by saying that you know, hundreds and thousands of um, civil servants look at the individual countries and they um, draw up country-specific reform recommendations. And they are printed, they are read, smiled about, and archived. And nothing really happens with them. But if you say, here you've got the funds and here you've got the recommendations and only when recommendations are implemented you end up getting funds. For example, it says um, energizing or, uh, or reforming uh, or liberalizing the energy market and you only get money from the structural funds if this issue is tackled and by doing that you could create European added values because these are recommendations for more competitiveness and growth, um, migration, security I've mentioned, defense, these are other areas and if the expenditure increases there and the infrastructure improves then I'm um, quite sure that we could explain to the European taxpayer or the German taxpayer that um, more money needs to be put into this area but if it's more money into a European budget just with the current status quo then this willingness um, is less than developed so first reforming the EU budget we're fighting for this and we're looking um, for partners in Europe in order to do this and then you can develop a willingness to pay more there was one more request from the floor Benedict Benedikt Zacher, I am an entrepreneur in um, the um, health sector. I founded Pflege.de. I wanted to um, pick up the um, last question, this um, reference um, frame, and I wanted to add a fourth dimension, namely time. It's everybody understands, not only the 85-year-old person who wrote that letter to you, that we need a um, fairness between the generations, justice between the generations, but there um, are areas like um, nursing care where it is very difficult to explain to people that 50% of the people who live today will at some point require nursing care and they cannot um, cover these costs um, out of their private pockets. Daniel Barr once said that in um, That, that, that there need to be um, subsidies. Um, but And this is a philosophical question. Are there areas where you have to force people to make the right decision, where um, it needs to be the um, state that decides what the common good is, and then this needs to be um, cast into a law, like the debt ceiling, um, where 
it needs to be um, superimposed on people so that they don't fall into certain traps um, later in life. And that's what we're doing day after day. The pension insurance is a way of coercing people to pay premiums. And um, we all know that when you're 30 years old, you don't really think about what's happening when you're 70. That's quite normal. You look at what's happening tomorrow, next week, next year, but you don't um, try to answer the question of what's going to happen when you're 70 years old. That's a very abstract question. And um, the present is always more present. And it was a um, decision, a clear decision to say with the um, pension insurance, we force people to um, be preemptive um, and think of the time after they've retired. And the health insurance is the same thing. A healthy 20-year-old will not enter into a health insurance um, plan because um, he's going to say, I'm fit so I can survive the next 10 years. Most of the time, things turn out differently. And that's why at some point the health insurance was invented. So we do have systems in place that limit people in their capacity as free citizens and take them and, and, and take their focus away from the present and into the future, 20, 30, 40 years from now. The question of how this can be expanded, I mean, um, the um, nursing care insurance was the big issue of the 1990s, whether it can be um, re-established and have um, statutory um, premiums. This is something that was discussed um, at length, and at that time, it wasn't quite foreseeable that there would be such a big need, and that's why it wasn't um, really um, pushed through that much. But I fought for this for 10 years, and I um, started to um, set up um, a um, provision fund. 1.2 billion euros per year are put into a provision fund for that time when the baby boomers end up becoming um, um, nursing care patients. As, as soon as the um, pill against dementia will um, be invented, we can throw all of our plans away, but it's better to have some money in the bank, so to say. As soon as the strong um, age cohorts will be 80 years or older, we have 1.2 billion euros in provisions per year. And that's what we as society said, and that's what we're doing at the moment through our pension insurance schemes. And we are taking away from what we have today to have more later. And I'm interested to learn in this uh, about this relationship between free trade and protectionism. We are all used to seeing free trade as something positive, and we are seeing increasing protectionist ideas. I didn't only want to mention Mr. Trump, but also Mr. Orban. He said, if I the more borders I have, the better off I am. How can this be solved? I think, let me look at it from another angle. Free trade as an abstract concept isn't as accepted everywhere as it is here. And that's why you have to break it down to concrete terms and be honest. Free trade leads to more wealth. I'm not an economist, but I look at um, the professors here who seem to also accept this statement. So free trade leads to more wealth, but we always say more wealth for everybody, and that's not true. Free trade per se, and it has to because it's um, inherently logic, um, in the system of competition, there are um, advantages and disadvantages. So in certain areas, people might lose jobs. So wealth the wealth of those societies and countries participating in free trade increases in general, but for individuals, this might mean that their company, which is suddenly in a competitive situation with companies in other countries, might lose their jobs. And if we on TV say wealth and uh, free trade leads to wealth for everybody, then the person who has just lost their job says they're putting my leg. And that's why we have to communicate this in a way that explains wealth um, in general increases. It's a benefit for everybody. But we have to build bridges for those who are in a um, tough competition and lose their jobs. The second thing is, and together with the entrepreneurs, we are responsible here to not only do this abstractly on TV. I always tell the people in my constituency where I know the 
um, entrepreneurs and the companies, and I know where they are exporting to, not only um, into Europe, but around the world. They're mechanical engineers, etc. And I always um, ask them or tell them, in your work council meetings, have you ever explained to them how the percentage of the turnover and the jobs depend on trade with non-European and European countries? So that people really understand that when we talk about free trade and TTIP or CETA, that this is anything but an abstract debate in Europe or in Brussels and Berlin, but that it is concretely linked to jobs in your companies. And we as policymakers cannot always do this all by ourselves. When I tell the entrepreneurs to do that, they always say, no, our associations are doing it. No, you have to do it for your own employees and explain to them how many jobs depend on um, free trade so that they understand that it's nothing that's abstract or evil but concrete and important for them. And then you will um, achieve this level of acceptance. We are seeing protectionist tendencies and um, I mean, if you if you're bored, by the way, read an in, in interview of Trump and uh, a playboy interview of Trump in 1990, um, 27 years ago. The topics that he is currently thinking about um, were already uh, mentioned back then, so he seems to be at least consistent. The first 12 pages of the interview, you might as well forget them. But then all of these topics are mentioned. Um, the nuclear issue, North Korea, then Japan, Germany, Western Europe, they um, live um, on our backs in NATO, etc., as early as 1990, and then free trade, because Trump doesn't say, I want no free trade. He says the free trade agreements we have are unfair for the United States. Whether they are or not is something entirely different, but that's his perception. And if you um, look at China, for example, we also have our turfs, as you would say, steel, solar industry. If you look at the Chinese companies that um, are currently on a shopping spree in Europe and how difficult it is at the same time for um, non-Chinese companies to, um, to, to, to settle because free trade is not a one-way street, then there's um, quite a lot of issues that can be discussed. But whether you do it via Twitter or um, differently is um, something that can be discussed for a long time. But there is the need to advocate the fact that free trade shouldn't be a one-way street, not just with Trump, but... Um, and there are negative. There is one more question, but I would like to briefly interrupt our deliberations because we had a voting tool in place at Covoco on Voco for the first time ever. There were three questions, and everybody had an opportunity to answer digitally. This question was a question to the community as a whole. 470 people participated. I would like to briefly show you the results. The first question was, what should fiscal flexibility mainly be used for? Pay off debts. 39% said yes which uh, corresponds to what you've just told us. Lower taxes, 11%. Increase public investment, 25%. And we also talked about it before. It's problematic. And a combination of A to C, 25%. Would you like to comment on the results? No, um, we talked about um, change in society. 15 years ago, nobody um, um, told you to pay off debts when you were on an election campaign. And today, in, particularly in the past weeks, um, I was always asked, when do you um, pay off debts? And I was quite surprised about this because this isn't a real benefit for people. But we are seeing something that has changed in the past 10 years in the political debate, this um, focus of making provisions for tomorrow and paying off debts. I like it. What would you have said if you had to vote? In the current situation, I would probably focus on lowering taxes. I'm not even allowed to say this as a representative of the Ministry of Finances, but at the moment we have a little bit too much money. And that's why it would make sense to lower taxes because bad years are coming back and the current expenditures that we 
are establishing will, you know, bite us in the back in the bad years. So lowering taxes is good. Mr. Fink, what did you say or what do you say? The first answer here is absolutely um, logical from my point of view when you try to answer or the question of how to create leeways. But Jens Spahn gave us a very um, interesting insight. It's not too smart to massively expand this leeway at the moment because we would have um, entered into commitments that we don't want to have in a few years when it comes to long-term sustainable um, economic performance. So I would probably also use the second, um, the paying off debts is something that I like as an idea. But this also shows that we are all concerned by the debt. I mean, it's a burden for all of us. It's an unknown entity. We don't know how much it is indeed. And we don't know what will be the result, the impact. It's a scenario people don't like to see because people want to have taxes lowered normally. As I said, it has changed considerably. Some people say before you lower taxes, pay off your debts. And 10 years ago, I never heard that. Next, Next question. This was, by the way, the favorite question. And we got the greatest participation here. For me, the biggest challenge of the common legislative period is digitization, European integration, refugee and migration policy, or energy and climate policy. Now, here, most said European integration. Now, my standard answer is everything is connected. We talked about Europe, um, a reasonable um, refugee and migration policy can only be done at the European level um, within the area of free movement. That the same applies to the other two issues, um, digitalization policy for 80 million um, citizens who are in competition with um, three or what, four billion Chinese um, who have a huge market and Alibaba is so big we cannot even imagine it and Americans with 330 million. So everything is connected. Digitalization can only work in Europe. Um, Refugee um, energy um, policy can only work in Europe. But the biggest challenge is Europe. Sure, because it contains everything. Yes, definitely. And I think the first um, aspect, digitalization, um, we have the responsibility to create a framework here within which we can prepare the future and this includes education digitalization is connected to education and education directed into the new digital world because we talked about the free trade we have an exchange we need this exchange and we are seeing um, competitors um, develop based on this um, economic um, relationship between um, countries. And we have to ask ourselves what we want to be competitive with 20 years from now. And if we don't digitalize um, all of these expenditures that we're having for our neighbors, for the global giants, etc., will not work. And um, I frequently hear in debates, Google, Facebook, Amazon will disappear again. But the question is more whether our business model is affected by them and what we are doing to be one step ahead as we used to be in the past. Um, building an Audi A8 wasn't easy and isn't easy, but there are more and more similar products um, made by more and more uh, um, other um, countries. So how can we get into the next generation? How do we invest and how much are we invested into this future and not just mentioning a couple of buzzwords, and this is what I'm concerned about most, so digitalization at the top. The third question in our poll was, by what is the common good of the 21st century challenge the most? Now, here, most people said it's the loss of common values followed by social inequality was 32% self-actualization and individualization that's the selfishness of our society 15 percent and then and that's surprising globalization 10 percent mr Spahn, where is the biggest danger 
Now, again, this is also something that is um, connected, but the strong focus on the loss of common values is something that's quite unexpected. But it does show, and that's also something we've seen in the past two or three years, more so than before. I think I would say that the German um, society is as bourgeois and conservative as it has um, as it hasn't been in a long time. The social, uh, the relationships, personal relationships, home, the fact that you can talk about Heimat in German again without um, people frowning at you. I think this is. I mean, if you 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 can only be open for um, strange and foreign and new things if you know who you are. Ninety percent of the young people um, say, "I want to raise my children the way my parents raised me." We have the most boring youth um, at the moment than we had in 100 years. But at the same time, this also expresses a need for um, reliability, um, trustworthiness, orientation, cultural um, security, and secure and safe values, etc. And um, 10 years ago, this was not as noticeable. And it becomes quite clear here. So this might be linked to globalization, migration, and all these other issues. I think it's a consequence of these things. Yeah, I think. I agree. The loss of common values, these these common codes that you need for a society to function is a huge challenge um, from an institutional point of view or in um, daily lives. The global company, the global citizen, it's a nice concept, but it needs to be in line with the core values. And um, I think, Mr. Simps, um, you mentioned this and. Um, I think these answers show that globalization is an opportunity and not a risk, and that with global that you can deal with globalization in an enlightened way in, and, and, and say, I use the opportunities of globalization instead of saying, I don't understand it anymore, I step off. I think it's not really representative, this um, survey. There are a lot of people who would um, tend to disagree. But for the group who answered here, I think it's very encouraging. Thank you. Maybe one more question from the floor, and then we will have reached the end of the evening. Good evening, Michael Kröger is my name. I um, am an editor at Manager Magazine. We heard where expenditures will increase, um, pension, um, health, and um, education, research, etc. Where will they go down? Um, in view of a common good until 2030 from your point of view. And we also heard that the state expenditure um, will go up. But where does that money come from? You said you want to lower taxes. Where do you want to get the money from if at the same time the expenditure increases for the common good? Well, I think what we need, and this brings me back to the social realm again, this is connected to efficiency, but also to the values inherent in social um, costs. We need to look at whether what we are doing at the moment whether this is the right thing, namely um, funding unemployment. We're doing this for too long instead of turning unemployment into um, prospects for the future. I'm not talking about somebody who's unemployed for two months, um, but we have more than one million people who are um, unemployed for 12 months or longer. And we have to try to find out together, not for everybody, that's impossible, but at least for a couple of hundred thousands, um, how we can um, bring them back into employment. Maybe somebody will have to go to their doors and pick them up every um, morning for six months and bring them somewhere. But um, it's um, more activating than just giving them money. There are a lot of l things that are linked to this, um, health issues, family issues, social issues. And there are um, a couple of programs, even though we haven't really looked at this in detail, at the regular unemployment and structural unemployment, the um, economic cycle, the unemployment that is based on the economic cycle needs to be looked at in detail so that we can try to find out how we can take measures now to 
reduce costs in the future. And you can also exert a little bit more pressure on people who are 25 years old and um, than 55 year olds. Um, it's too simple in this country when you're 23, 25, or 26. Um, you say, if I don't like to go to work, um, I stay at home after five weeks. When somebody's 55 years old, it's more difficult to change life. Um, even there, we can look at some issues instead of just transferring money, but we can exert a little bit of pressure so that a, um, an outlook for the future can be created. And the second question, how do we want to finance things? That brings me back to growth again and again. I think this anti-growth um, advocates are difficult. Um, growth doesn't necessarily um, mean resource consumption. I think we've come quite a long way in Germany. Um, we need to focus on growth that doesn't use resources or only a few resources, but without economic growth, and that brings us back to digitalization, it is very difficult for us to remain ex export world champions. We are export world champions because our products are among the best. And if this beautiful country is one of the oldest countries in the world and the social standards that we're currently having will not exist like this in 10 or 15 years from now, if you say we don't need growth and at the same time you want to play in the first league, then um, you're being naive. Not if you want to maintain the standard that we're having and if you want to have the income that um, you're having. It might work with a 30-hour week if um, digitalization brings so much more productivity that everything will have to be organized um, differently. But we need uh, an increased productivity, growth, and innovation for a country like Germany and Europe as a whole to advance. Um, 25% of the economic performance, 50% of the world um, expenditures for 8% um, of the world population. And this can only work if you're economically successful. That's the prerequisite. It's trite, but that's something that um, some people tend to question. There were the economists at Convoco who talked about growth there will be more struggles for the distribution if there is less growth because the cake will have the same size no matter what. Now this is the end of our Q&A session but I would like to come back to the common good. There were changes made in the constitution, in the basic law and people do not, did not really talk about it. When we, when the government and the regions talked about how to spend the money, today the federal government is allowed to get involved in regional affairs. Is this good for the common good in a decentralized system? It's the classic. My well, classic answer would be depends. Now the way it was done was not optimal because federalism for um, a couple of years was defined as 16 premiers going to Berlin to take home some money. But the general idea of federalism was to create spatial planning, education, and other areas at the lender level so that um, competition exists, um, education, competition, etc. Um, and you can also um, see this at the edu when, when you look at education. And the question is, why is the education in the north of Germany, in Bremen, for example, not as good as in Bavaria? And we see that this bad educational policy was continued in some lenders. So this type of competition doesn't seem to work. So the question is, where are areas that um, have to be regulated at the lender level? And where um, does it make more sense to have more centralization? It, this is a change of the um, constitution that wasn't really um, taken um, note of. The federal level can now set up a an internet and an, an, an internet portal at the federal level, and we can now um, force the municipal levels to do this. And citizens don't care about this because they want to um, apply for um, certain things online and. Um, they don't care where this um, platform is set up. And I think centralism makes sense here. And other areas where we've um, used this and 
there's there's one area. I mean, I talk like an old person here, but I've been in Parliament for 15 years now, and in these 15 years, the um, debates have changed, and the education debate has changed as well. 10 to 15 years ago, I didn't um, experience people questioning the um, federal um, system in education, but more and more people ask, why do we have these differences between the different Länder, between Bavaria, Bremen, Rheinland-Pfalz, etc.? When I move with my children, why is the um, curriculum so different in the new region that we move to? So the acceptance of the federal or the lender responsibility here has dwindled down, and we have to deal with this um, politically. I still support the idea of federalism because I know we um, probably um, end up coming more to an agreement at the um, Bremen level and not the um, Bavaria level, or Saxony. Saxony is even better when it comes to um, educational um, performance. But we see that there is a problem when it comes to accepting um, federalism in certain areas. And you think about it, you try to come to a solution without questioning federalism per se, but this is definitely something that will be discussed at length in the um, coming years. Um, what's the better level? Thank you. Thank you. Will you talk more about the common good after tonight's conversation? <laughs> That's the only thing I talk about all day. It's well with <laughs> Yeah, but uh, uh, I will use this beautiful term now more frequently because I really think there are so many nice German words that are beautiful when you think about them for a little bit and that are very difficult to translate into another country. Um, in, in many cases, I don't find good English translations for German terms that we don't use frequently enough. Das finde ich gut. Makes me happy. Thank you very much, Mr. Spahn, for having joined us tonight. Mr. Dr. Fink, thank you very much. I would like to thank the audience for your wonderful questions, and I would like to thank Professor Jörg Kochel, the president of the ESMP, for being our host. Enjoy a snack and a drink now with us.